All right, so in this video, we're going to wrap up our stuff on German unification by talking about politics. of the German Empire post-unification. So this is the stuff that Bismarck is going to do now that the German Empire is complete. So <clears throat> there are two big sets of policies Bismarck puts in place after unification. So the first one of these is called the Kulturkampf, and the other one of these is his big program of social welfare. And we'll hit both of these here in this video. All right, so the first one of these is the Kulturkampf. Or in English, the culture war. And the Kulturkampf was Bismarck's anti-Catholic campaign. Now, to give a little bit of context for this, most Germans were Protestant, but at the time of unification, Roughly about 23% were Catholic. And these were the ones that joined last because of the Franco-Prussian War. So these were the ones that really did not want to be part of Prussia, but were forced into joining Prussia after the Franco-Prussian War. Adding to this, most of the little Germanies including Prussia had enacted some sort of freedom of religion and a separation of church and state. And the Catholic ones hadn't. So a, the Catholic little Germany's had more Catholic control over the government and the more liberal or Protestant little Germanies, it just didn't fit with them. And one more reason why this took place was that the Pope himself who was the same pope that was opposed to Italian unification way back in the 1860s, was against these nationalist unification efforts. And so Bismarck was afraid that Catholic Germans
would be more loyal to the Pope than to Wilhelm. And not to go too far outside of the scope of the course, this was also the same argument made against JFK in the United States. It wasn't really a thing for John F. Kennedy, and it really wasn't a thing for the uh, Catholic Germans either, but that was a fear. Uh, so Bismarck goes about trying to cut Catholics out of the political process. the Catholics respond by forming their own political party and it's called the Center Party but they're sometimes also called the Ultramontanes. You might see that at some point, so that's just another name for this Catholic party. One of the last big things to happen in 1878, Bismarck expels the Jesuits from Germany as they are seen as spies for the church. The Kulturkampf ends in 1878. There are a couple of events that happen in 1878 that cause this culture war against the Catholics to end. The first is that we get a new pope. The first thing is we get a new pope. And this new pope... actually likes a lot of what Bismarck is doing domestically with his social programs, which we're going to turn to in a second. And the second thing is that the socialists start gaining popularity and seats in the German parliament and Bismarck needs the center party to help suppress the socialists. So 
So if you're looking at this, and this sounds familiar, a lot of what Bismarck was doing in the run-up to German unification, we see here. He's kind of doing the same procedures. He's playing groups off of each other to get his desired effect. It works well in foreign policy, but remember, Bismarck has to live with these people. And they don't like being manipulated like this. So let's move on to the other major political program that Bismarck puts in place, and that is his social welfare system. So if this stuff is the stick, the social welfare system is the carrot. Bismarck wanted all Germans to support the German government. And to do this, he's going to take a bottom-up approach. He's going to give give things to people at the bottom of society to gain their loyalty. So we're going to get a number of like safety net programs. Unemployment insurance. Old age pensions. Accident insurance. All the stuff that we've been saying since the beginning were needed to mitigate the problems of industrialization. Bismarck is just going to give people. They don't even have to fight for it. He's going to give it away. He's also going to involve employers in these decisions to make sure they are on board too. So he really is trying to make people like him by giving them things that they want. But remember, for Bismarck, none of this stuff is done without an ulterior motive. So a lot of these ideas were designed to undercut the socialists and take away the things they are fighting for. And if there are, you know, if you take away the, the simple things that they're fighting for, there is less chance of a socialist revolution. Now, both of these, both of these things, well, hold on. These are the things that the Pope liked. The Pope liked these policies, and that kind of helped end 
the Kulturkampf. But remember, and this is the point that I was about to make, is that these domestic uses of realpolitik were not nearly as successful as their applications in foreign policy. So the Germans don't really like being used against each other like Bismarck is doing. And so Bismarck is not especially popular inside of Germany. Even if he is giving people stuff that they might want, they, they don't like being used. And they can tell they're being used. He is still doing this stuff in foreign policy, and it's working just as well as it had always worked. He wants to keep France isolated, and they are. And he wants to keep Russia happy and they are. But all of this comes crashing down in 1890. In 1890, Wilhelm I dies, and we get his grandson coming to power. And we get Wilhelm II. Now this is the guy that's going to be running Germany. During World War I. Now Wilhelm II. And Bismarck did not get along. And Bismarck was fired soon after Wilhelm II came to power. Wilhelm II wanted to do things his own way, and he was not nearly as calm or calculating, depending on how you want to view Bismarck, and he made the Russians upset, and so they did not re-sign the Treaty of Alliance with Germany. So now Russia is out there by themselves too, which is going to cause France and Russia to join up, eventually joined by the United Kingdom. And this is going to set up one side of World War I. So Bismarck does not survive much longer after this. I think he dies a few, he dies a few years after he was fired. But he did leave us with a few parting thoughts. Bismarck was probably the most prescient observer of European politics and European history, 
And so he did leave us with a few final thoughts. He said that 20 years after he was fired, so 20 years, so 1910, he's guessing, Germany would fall apart. And he was close. It was actually... 28 years. He was close. He also said, and this is one of his most famous quotes, he said, the next great European war will come out of some damned fool thing in the Balkans. And that's exactly what happened when World War I starts, because it starts right there in the Balkans. All right, so we are now done with the big concept of uh, political nationalism. And we're going to round out time period three with some stuff about the new imperialism, basically the European takeover of uh, East Asia and Africa. And that will be our next big topic that we'll cover, wrapping up time period three. So until then, this is Mr. Nissen signing off.